Our story of gut tube formation begins with the very important milestone of embryonic folding. So for orientation, let's first take a look at the embryo during longitudinal folding uh, in week four. You could see here the amniotic cavity dorsally, the yolk sac ventrally, uh, oropharyngeal membrane cranially, and cloacal membrane caudally. So embryonic folding is exactly what will establish the foregut, the hindgut, uh, and the midgut, which as you can see here are um, in communication with the umbilical vesicle or the yolk sac, right? And by the end of week four, this communication pinches and narrows as the omphaloenteric duct or the vitellin duct in the midgut. Notice how the allantois and the hepatic or the liver bud also arise after folding. Now remember that transverse folding is what will cause the lateral edges of the embryonic disc to merge in the median plane. Uh, and this will convert the trilaminar disc uh, into a more cylindrical embryo, which you'll see here in this animation. Part of the endoderm during that process will also become incorporated into the embryo, uh, forming the midgut. And we mentioned that there would be this narrow connection between the midgut and the yolk sac, right, the vitellin duct. But by around week 10, uh, it's obliterated, and so the connection is lost, fully isolating the midgut within the embryo. And what's left thereafter would be the umbilical cord. Okay, so a little teaser there for what's about to happen. Uh, and from here, we can see that the midgut is suspended by a dorsal mesentery from the body wall. And this is a story that will continue later on in the video. Okay, development of the foregut. So take a look at this mid-sagittal section of a four-week-old embryo. Uh, it shows you the derivatives of the foregut and also the derivatives of the respiratory system cranially. Okay? So to start this next chapter of the story, the development of the stomach, uh, let's first take a look at a transverse section from above. So bird's eye view here. This transverse section will help us see that the primordial stomach is at first initially oriented along the median plane, right? Attached to the, uh, the body wall by mesentery, which has different names depending on where it is. So the dorsal mesogastrium attaches the stomach to the dorsal body wall and the ventral mesogastrium to the ventral body wall. The liver will develop in the ventral mesentery uh, and it's attached to the ventral abdominal wall by the falciform ligament. The pancreas and the spleen will form in the dorsal mesogastrium uh, and they'll make an appearance shortly, not to worry. Now, during week four, the stomach will twist 90 degrees clockwise from this view and its dorsal border will grow faster than the ventral border, forming the greater curvature of the stomach. You can appreciate by looking at this that when the stomach moves, other things are gonna move with it, right? Like the dorsal mesogastrium, which gets pushed to the left. Again, this is left, this is right, because this is a bird's eye view of a transverse section, yeah? So during rotation of the stomach, the dorsal mesogastrium gets pushed to the left, and it will form the greater omentum, this mesenteric apron, right, that will drape caudally um, over the small intestine. And the pancreas and the spleen, since they form within the dorsal mesogastrium, they'll also be pushed to the left. And lastly, a branch from the celiac trunk also hitches a ride to the left. Uh, and while it's in commute, it'll form a lot of different branches that will supply different parts of the foregut. So the primordial stomach, recall, is a fusiform dilation of the caudal end of the foregut. So it starts off looking like a flat fish, right? And we just saw the primordial stomach rotating 90 degrees clockwise in a transverse section. But let's rewind that, and this time I want us to look at it ventrolaterally. Yeah. So the dorsal border of the stomach again becomes the greater curvature. But what you can appreciate now is that the dorsal border pushes to face to the left this way, okay? It'll face the left side. And the ventral border, or the lesser curvature, pushes to the right to face the right that way, okay? A little confusing, so let me do that again. The greater curvature pushes to face left, and the lesser curvature pushes to face right. So as to establish the left side of the primordial stomach as the ventral surface, and the right side as the dorsal surface. Uh, 
Now, as this happens, the proximal part of the stomach will also move caudally, right? It moves down. And the distal part moves cranially, and it moves up. So it kind of squishes in on itself, if you will, uh, in the coronal plane. And after all is said and done, the stomach goes from flat fish along the median plane to C-shaped along the coronal plane during weeks six to seven uh, as a result of all the growth and the twisting that happens. Let's talk about the neighbors of the stomach now. So liver and gallbladder. During week four, early week four, uh, a ventral outgrowth from the distal part of the foregut will start to emerge. Uh, and as it grows, it'll invade the surrounding septum transversum which you know partially forms the diaphragm, right? This ventral outgrowth is what we call the hepatic bud. It'll divide into a larger bud, the hepatic diverticulum, the primordial liver, and a smaller caudal bud, which will form the gallbladder. Importantly, we can also see here that the stalk of the hepatic diverticulum forms the bile duct, right? Which will eventually form the cystic duct connecting to the gallbladder. The primordial liver, needless to say, will enlarge rapidly and fill most of the upper abdominal cavity. Let's take a closer look at that cystic duct. Uh, notice how it joins the hepatic duct to form the bile duct, which will connect the gallbladder and the liver to the developing duodenum. We can also see here the two building blocks of the pancreas, which are also connected to the duodenum. So during week five, the dorsal pancreatic bud will emerge first, and it emerges higher than the ventral pancreatic bud, but both are sandwiched between layers of their corresponding mesogastrium, okay? Uh, and there's a connection that remains between the duodenum and our accessory organs here. Now remember, when the stomach underwent its 90-degree clockwise rotation, other things moved with it, right? Well, it turns out that the duodenum is another victim of that rotation. And so when the stomach rotates clockwise, uh, so this is the duodenum at around week five. It'll twist to the right. And that has a whole other set of consequences. For the pancreatic buds, rotation of the duodenum will carry the ventral pancreatic bud dorsally. The bile duct and the developing liver are also carried dorsally and cranially upwards, uh, which will allow the liver to fill most of the upper abdominal cavity. And eventually, the ventral pancreatic bud fuses with its dorsal partner, and they live happily ever after in the adult as the united pancreas. The ventral pancreatic bud will form uh, the inferior head of the pancreas and the uncinate process. Uncinate means hook-shaped, and the dorsal bud forms the rest of, you know, the pancreatic head, the body, and the tail. The pancreatic duct, now, uh, is formed from the duct of the ventral bud and the distal part of the duct of the dorsal bud. To get a better view of that, let's take another cross-section, okay? So dorsal pancreatic bud here, ventral bud here, all connected to the duodenum, which is pointing out at you. Isn't that fun? Now, when the duodenum twists to the right, the ventral pancreatic bud and the bile duct hitch a ride. They're headed dorsally. And by week eight, the two pancreatic buds fuse, okay? Uh, as a result, we see that the ducts of both pancreatic buds, both ducts, contribute to the main pancreatic duct right here. Uh, and sometimes the proximal dorsal duct persists as the accessory pancreatic duct, which you can see opens into the minor duodenal papilla. We're gonna end off this long chapter of the foregut here with another transverse section, short and sweet. The last point I want you to see is that after the stomach and the duodenum rotate, most of the pancreas and the duodenum get pinned to the posterior body wall. Okay, so take a look at that there. And since that happens, since they're now pinned to the posterior body wall, they are now considered secondarily retroperitoneal organs. The midgut, remember, gives rise to the small intestine, including the duodenum distal to the opening of the bile duct, which is the major duodenal papilla. It also gives rise to the cecum, the appendix, the ascending colon, and the proximal two-thirds of the transverse colon. 
Now, by the start of week six, something really interesting happens to the C-shaped midgut. Uh, it'll elongate, and it'll protrude into the proximal part of the umbilical cord. Um, and this is what we call the umbilical herniation, right, which happens in week six. So the vitellin duct, or the omphaloenteric duct, from the beginning of our story, we see connect the midgut to the umbilical vesicle. Importantly, it also separates the cranial limb in yellow from the caudal limb of the midgut in pink. We can also see here the celiac trunk supplying the foregut and the superior mesenteric artery, or the SMA, which supplies the midgut. Now, we start yet another series of twists and rotations. The rotation of the midgut loop, but this time it starts in the umbilical cord. By early week six, the midgut loop will rotate 90 degrees counterclockwise, and the SMA provides an axis around which the rotation will happen. So after this initial 90 degree rotation around the SMA, we see that the caudal limb faces to the left and the cranial limb, of course, to the right. In parallel, uh, the caudal limb develops what we call the cecal swelling at week six, which will form the cecum and the appendix, of course. And the cranial limb, you can see, will form loops and it'll become quite convoluted. But we're not done rotating quite yet. In fact, we just started. So to resolve the umbilical herniation, the abdominal cavity gets larger as the embryo grows. Right, uh, And it gets large enough to allow the midgut hernia back in at around week 10, which is also when the vitalin duct obliterates. Right? Now, reduction of the midgut hernia will start with the cranial limb being first to return with another 90 degree counterclockwise rotation. As it rotates, it'll pass under the caudal limb and the SMA. And with a final 90 degree counterclockwise rotation by week 11, the caudal limb is the last to return and it passes in front of the cranial limb to the right. We see that the small intestine now occupies the central abdomen, and the large intestine lines the borders of the abdomen. And after all is said and done, you can see that the midgut rotates a total of 270 degrees counterclockwise in three different stages. Let's do a quick intermission here and talk about the mesentery ventral view given to you here. We see the hepatic and splenic flexures of the colon abutting the liver and the spleen, respectively, uh, the mesentery of the sigmoid colon, and the greater omentum, which hangs from the greater curvature of the stomach. A cross-sectional view here shows you the peritoneum, ascending and descending colon, and how they're eventually fixated to the body wall. A sagittal section now will show you the stomach, the duodenum and the pancreas with their peritoneal attachments, and we also see the greater omentum and transverse colon here as well. The greater omentum will fuse with the mesentery of the transverse colon, or the transverse mesocolon. Now, the peritoneum that overlies the distal duodenum, the pancreas, and also the ascending and descending colon, that peritoneum is fused to the posterior body wall, you see. And so these organs, are retroperitoneal, okay? They're sandwiched between the peritoneum and the posterior body wall. On the other hand, the rest of the small intestine, the appendix, transverse colon, sigmoid colon, uh, even the stomach, these organs are suspended within the peritoneal cavity by mesentery that attaches to the posterior body wall. And since they're in the peritoneum and are not directly positioned by the posterior body wall, these are intraperitoneal organs. For the last chapter of the story, the hindgut, the hindgut gives rise to the distal third of the transverse colon, the descending colon, the sigmoid colon, the rectum, the superior two thirds of the anal canal, and also the epithelium of the urinary bladder uh, and the urethra. It's supplied by the inferior mesenteric artery. The terminal end of the hindgut will expand to form the endoderm lined cloaca, which communicates with the allantois. And you can see is the space where the hindgut and the allantois empty into. Now, at around week six, a mesenchymal wedge called the urorectal septum will form and partition the cloaca 
into a ventral urogenital sinus and a dorsal anorectal canal. The urorectal septum comes into contact with the cloacal membrane at the perineum, and it divides this area into an anterior urogenital membrane and a posterior anal membrane. The ectodermal-lined proctodium here contributes to the inferior third of the anal canal. It's also called the anal pit. Lastly, by week seven, the anterior part of the uh, cloacal membrane ruptures. And by week eight, the anal membrane does the same. Rupture sounds like a bad thing, but the membranes rupture just so that the urogenital and digestive systems actually open into the great outdoors.